I know you guys have a lot of questions for our new coach, but before we get to that, I'd like to say first thank you to the DeVos family and Alex for allowing us to take the long, steady approach to this process. And I think it's very important that we go through it the right way so that we come out the right end. Um, I think it's been written, but I know that uh, a couple have asked when, when John and I were last uh, looking at, at a coaching search in Milwaukee about five years ago, uh, one of the names that we stumbled upon, a guy who had never been a head coach before, was Steve Clifford. And we brought him in and he blew us away. He was uh, so prepared and passionate and uh, really um, just thorough in every aspect about how he approaches player development, XOs, game management, organizational abilities, everything. And so we called his agent to request a second interview and the next day the Charlotte Hornets signed him. So he didn't know but he's been a marked man ever since that, that day. And uh, I sit here five years later and uh, I'm thrilled to announce the next coach of the Orlando Magic, Steve Clifford. So no, it's great to be here, and, and I too, I want to start by thanking the DeVos family. Uh, we had a great, great meeting with them last night, and uh, to be honest, it was, uh, it warms your heart to just, just spend time with them, and I forgot what a, what a great ownership group they are, uh, and that's where everything starts, as you know, in this league. Um, I'm a firm believer that team chemistry starts with organizational chemistry, and that starts always with the ownership group. And, Last time I was here, they were uh, so supportive and unbelievably committed uh, to what we did. Uh, they have high expectations of how we all uh, represent them off the court, and then also, which is fair, uh, great expectations of what we do on the court, which is what this league is all about. So I want to start by thanking them. Next, uh, I want to start to thank Jeff so much, and, and John and Alex, uh, for their confidence in me and the opportunity to come back here uh, and be part of this organization again. Um, I've had 18 great years in this league. I've enjoyed every year, but none more than the five years here. And it started with uh, the working relationship on the basketball side, which I'm so convinced that uh, the, uh, I think the philosophy that Jeff has, that John has, that they gave to me is so much in line with what I believe. I, I believe this is going to be a, a great opportunity for me to not only do well as a head coach, but also grow and learn from them. Uh, and then just a bigger part of that was the relationship and the synergy, kind of chemistry togetherness that the basketball side had with the business side before, which obviously, you know, Alex, Charlie, everybody, Jim was a big part of, and they're still here, and I believe that we can do that again. So. I think it all starts with that, um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's great to be here, and I'm excited to get started. I think it's crucial. It, it's uh, seventh coach in five years, or I'm sorry, fifth coach in seven years, and um, it's very important that we start to establish our identity, create a through line, and, um, and, and be able to build on something that doesn't get turned over every season. So that went in, that was a big part of what we were looking for as we went into the search. Someone that we thought we could build and grow with and, and would have a long life um, philosophically and organizationally with the team. You know, you think about all the different cycles and events that we go through, the course of an NBA season, things that we look for. You don't control the draft. You know, there's a deadline, there are agents controlling information on players, visits. You don't control the trade deadline. There's a, there's a date, there are other teams that are, have their own agendas and they don't always make it easy on you. Very few times do you encounter a process that you as a team get to control. And this is perhaps the most important thing a team does in hiring a coach. And we needed to control this process to where we felt comfortable that we were making a hugely important decision for our, our organization and making the right one. 
And part of that is, I, I, I want to thank John in the back of the room there, lurking in the back of the room, because I wore him out. You know, the same questions again and again and again and again, because I believe that's how you find the right answers, you know? And, um, and as we come through the whole process, we're here at the end, and I'm thrilled with the result. Um, so so a, a deliberate approach, interviewing people that are of interest, um, um, sometimes you might have an interview with someone else that brings back another question about one of the other candidates. And so just to be very thoughtful and deliberate, there's just no reason to rush this. Let's get it right. So, um, you know, as to the qualities, um, you know, in Steve Clifford, uh, I think it's very unique that you get to find someone who's philosophically aligned with you, um, who has uh, a multi-skill uh, kind of, uh, what do they call them, Swiss Army Knives, uh, it, it, we call players with multi-skill sets, and, um, and also has a proven track record. So, you know, I'm not betting on something that I don't know, you know, uh, Steve Clifford has proven himself to be uh, an elite level NBA coach, uh, in addition to having great personal skills, uh, player development abilities, all the organizational bullet points that we had hoped to address. Well, a great five years, and obviously, you know, playing in a final uh, was, uh, you know, the most, that was the most exciting year I've ever had in coaching in the NBA. Uh, the next year, playing in the Eastern Conference Finals, you know, again, I believe we won 58 or 59 two years in a row. Great group of players, very professional, very committed. Um, you know, I love working for Stan, I love the staff. And then again, though, it started with the ownership and their commitment. And then I think, again, we had, it was just such a great energy level throughout the city and the organization. So uh, that part of it I enjoyed. The second part, frankly, and I don't think we get enough credit for this, is, you know, a lot of this four out one in was started with that team. You know, we were one of the first teams that ever uh, started playing four out. You know, uh, that team really took place when Tony Batie hurt his shoulder. He was going to start at the floor. And when Richard Lewis signed as a free agent, one of his big things was he, wasn't, he didn't want to play the four. He wanted to be a three man. I remember Stan brought him in. We were all holding his breath and told him, Richard, if you'll play the four, it's going to be hard for you. But I think we can be really good. And he said, hey, if that's what it's going to take to win, I'll play the four. And it changed our whole time here. I mean, that was the move that set the tone and then after that you remember we didn't play anybody that couldn't shoot threes we were one of the first teams that did that dwight and gore taught rolling and everybody else spaced out so uh you know it was a great lesson for all of us i'm not going to back away from that question but you know the old saying in the nba and it's so true is you know you never know a player until you coach them now i'm going to start to uh attempt to establish the right kind of relationships with these guys uh, tomorrow or tonight uh, because I want to get to know them. Uh, but there's a difference between, you know, being able to impact a player and just coaching them. I want to be able to impact each one of these guys in the right way. And uh, they're all accomplished players. They're the best players in the world. And if you want to gain the right type of credibility so that you can have the right impact on them and the type of partnership where the two of you come to a common place on how they have to play to play well and the team can function well when they're on the floor. I need to be up to speed and an absolute expert on their game. And I'm not that yet. I've coached against these guys here for a lot of years. I don't know them nearly the way I know Kemba Walker, Nick Batum, Michael Kidd Gilchrist. So this will start now. Um, I'll get to know them, I'll be watching them and evaluating them, but you can't guess, in my opinion, my experiences, you can't guess in this league if you want to do a good job of leading them in the right direction. I don't guess. I'll be watching, we'll start to work together, I want their input, and then I'll give them mine. We won't always agree, okay, uh, but I, I, it's, it's way too early for me to start judging anything other than uh, I do know, looking at it, health was a big problem this year. You know, you had a lot of good players miss a lot of games, and I know that just looking at the numbers. The other part, that's not good NBA coaching. I'm not going to sit here and guess by looking at some stat sheet and saying this guy's got to do this. Uh, but give me five or six weeks and ask me the question, and 
I will have a more definitive answer for you. Um, I learned, you know, the year in LA was a great learning experience, to be honest. To, to have the opportunity to watch Colby, watch Steve Nash, uh, Pau Gasol, and their interaction with the other guys, along with Dwight and Meta, was uh, one of the best years I've ever had in terms of learning and growing. I mean, when you're around great, great players, there's so much that you can learn that you know you can't read about or you know see. I mean, that was one of my my favorite years of learning. In terms of a head coach, um, I think uh, you know one of the things, frankly, is as much as anything else, is it's it's always going to get back to getting the most out of people. Um, having a way to play as a team that makes sense for this league. This league constantly changed. This year was different than last year. You have to be on top of that. A lot of study goes into it. But at the end of the day, as you're seeing in the playoffs, you know, Golden State came up big in the, the second half. Why? Two great players had the confidence level, knowledge of how they wanted to play to go off. And that's how normally it is. You know, people always talk about halftime adjustments. Watch these games. You know, a halftime adjustment is usually DJ Augustine was maybe one for six in the first half, and he went for seven for eight in the second. And so much of it is that connection from a coaching staff, an organizational standpoint, that the players know how they have to play, they're confident in themselves, and they go out and they play well. You need guys to do that. So trying, trying to constantly find ways to more effectively communicate we're not just the players, but the other people that you're working with, to me, is one of the most important qualities you can have in any, any work type situation, I find that. Second thing, and it was, it was where I failed this year, you can never take anything for granted. You know, we had gone to Charlotte, uh, they'd been the 30th, they were 30th in defense the year before we got there. We were top 10 the next three years. Uh, two years ago, we were actually 7th at the All-Star break, lost our backup center, struggled on our way in. And this year we were, I think, like 17th or 18th. And looking at the numbers, I spent just as much time on the defense, but I felt we were going to be a great defensive team. And if we could be a top 10, 12 offensive team, which we end up 13, I thought we could be right there. And I really believe that in some ways maybe I took the defense for granted. Can't do that in this league. Every year you have to start from scratch, as if you've never coached them before. We start with defense in training camp. You start with a stance. You start with individual defense. Then you go to help the same things they learned when they were in elementary school. There's no other way to do it. And we did do that this year uh, when I look at it. But I don't think we're nearly maybe in my mind, uh, maybe I just wasn't determined enough or I was more thinking offense. So I would say as much as anything, those were the two things I learned. The, the, same, the key there, frankly, was the same key that will be here, which is what I'm going to talk to these guys about in these next few days, it was committed players. Um, you know, I'll give you the, the best example is that year I coached Summer League, and uh, I hadn't been a head coach before, so I coached Summer League, and we had four of our guys. Uh, we had just drafted Cody Zeller, uh, Michael Kidd Gilchrist is in the second year, Jeffrey Taylor, and Biz. Mm -hmm. Biz was there, so they all played Summer League, and... Um, I remember when I first called Kemba, Kemba was in New York, and I said, listen, I'm going to coach Summer League. I'd love to have you come down, watch the practices in the morning, and we're going to scrimmage more at night. So he said, no problem. And then he came down, and the day before we started, he said, um, hey, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do all the practices. So I said, well, in the mornings, we're just going to do the drills. He said, Steve, if we're going to win, you know, i got to be on top of this stuff. He was the best returning player. And he practiced every drill. You know, he was the best returning player. He did every drill, every summer league. We went two a day for like five days. He did all ten of them. Every drill, he was the best player. He killed them in the scrimmages. And right then I knew that we had our leader, you know. Uh, but as a group, those guys committed to a great summer. That's what we have to do. You know, the off season is a time that you, that you get ready for training camp, not, not in September. And the thing that we have to concentrate now on is not what our record was last year or anything else. This is a total reset for every player. But it's going to start with everybody having a good summer. And a good summer for Jonathan at his age is different than DJ at his age. He's got a better idea what he has to do to have a better offseason. He's been through it before. That's why he's an established player. 
but all of us. We have to have a plan for each guy that makes sense, and then the work that they put forth and we help them with and guide them through will set up our year. So as much as anything, our first year in Charlotte was set up June, July, August, and September as much as it was anything else. Well, I think like anybody else who's been insistent in this, that's how you get your reputation. Um, but I, I think that I'd also like to make this point about player development. Player development never stops. You know, like these two guys were in the gym here. They're both, again, proven veteran NBA players. The best players in this league never stop finding ways to improve. They don't just stay in shape. They try to get in better shape. And, you know, look at, look at the great ones. LeBron's gotten better every year. It's better every year. Um, I remember, again, being in L.A., it was Steve Nash's second to his last year. He could only, because of his back issues, he could only work out about 20 minutes at a time. So in, in August that year, he went three times a day, 18 minutes a time. That's how precise he was with his workouts. And again, that's a guy who had been a league MVP. The best players, regardless of age, so player development never stops. Again, it's going to be different for veteran guys than it is younger guys. Um, but again, it's, it's okay. you, you know, player development is not separate from coaching. I think it's such a misnomer. The best coaches are good at player development because it's not just skills. It's not just shooting or dribble moves. Playing well is the skill part, the individual part, but just as big a part is then you have to know how you have to play so the team plays well when you're on the floor. And you have to be willing to do all of these things. Jeff and I were talking uh, today about certain things. There's amount of toughness plays and grit that if you don't have it, you can only be so good in this league. You know, there are guys that play for six or seven years, and maybe they score, but their pick and roll defense isn't good, their, their rebounding numbers aren't good, and they change them. It should never change. It should never change. And that's the job of an organization, of a staff, to point that out and then work with these guys in a way that they know how, again, I'm going to say it over and over, play in a way that they play well and the team functions well when they're on the floor. And that leads to more winning. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, listen, I, I, you know, I like Dwight. I've got a great relationship with Dwight. He had a good year for us this year. Nobody in this league has spent more time with Dwight than I have. I went to L.A. with Dwight. Um, I think that Dwight has great qualities. He's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. This league is difficult. These guys, all of them, they have people tugging at them in all different directions, and they're forced to make decisions all the time. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to make the right one. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm more glass half full. You know what? Dwight was here. We went to the finals. He was our best player. He was a dominant player in this league. We went to an Eastern Conference player. He was our best player. Um, he helped us go. We got here. This franchise hadn't won a playoff series, I think, for like nine, ten years. We won one the first year, finals the second year, Eastern Conference finals the third year. He was our best player. I can remember driving home after watching him some night saying, like, now this is a treat watching this guy play. So, um, you know, everybody, I guess we all get to choose how we think about our past, and those are my memories of him here. Well, I, I think that every year, um, I think probably in every pro sport, right, that you always look for external development, improvement in the offseason, and internal improvement. And obviously, continuity with the roster and continuity with your coaching staff is a big part of the internal improvement. Uh, you know, these guys will all have a coach that they're, I don't know if you call it assigned to, or they'll work with more closely. Um, and the relationship that they establish with that coach will be a big part of, again, how well they play. Uh, the next year. Same thing, you know, the head coach obviously has a big part with all that, but uh, obviously your coach, the philosophy, um, the, the NBA, because of the rules, 24 second shot clock, there's not as many different ways to play, obviously, as there are in, in college, but there's philosophically, you know, coach to coach, there's major differences. So um, obviously the continuity part, so that they know how we're going to play. They know what's important to me. I know what's important to them. Continuity can only help. So we're going to do the staff together. Uh, 
Jeff and John and I, and actually we're going to meet on that tomorrow. So um, today is, you know, hang out with you guys and, you know, <laughs> get back to Orlando and uh, everything like that. But, we'll, you know, we were, we are organized and we're going to start talk, discussing that tomorrow. Uh, really, as you know, I was fortunate in that we had a great team doctor, Dr. Garcia, who helped me a great deal. And then uh, I worked with a neurologist, Dr. Jones, who was phenomenal. And as he told me the second day, you don't have to change the way you work, you have to change the way you live. And that's what I've done. So going through it uh, was professionally the most difficult thing I've ever had to go through. It impacted our team in a bad way. Uh, I feel terrible about it. Um, it's a hard thing for players to do from going, you know, with their coach who had coached most of those guys for a long time. Even though Steven Sides did a phenomenal job, but it's just different. Then I came back and uh, it impacted our season. There's no question about that. Um, so professionally, you know, it was hard. Now, personally, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And what I learned is two things. Number one, uh, you need to sleep. No, you need to sleep. You know, I had just worked on staffs uh, since my first year in the NBA where I worked with a lot of guys who had incredible work capacity and we got in early and stayed late. And it's just, it's the way I lived for a long time. Uh, and then the second part of it is what you learn is, for me anyway, the way I could live and work at 51, 52, I could not do at 54, 55, and 56. Some people can, I've studied sleep. Some people are good forever, they don't have to sleep. For me, it didn't work out that way. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is this is, you know, modern medicine is incredible. I mean, I've learned so much about this sleep thing, but it only is good if you take advantage of it. And this wasn't something that just happened in September. This had been going on for a couple of years. You know, the year before they made me do an MRI. And I just should have been more forthcoming with the doctors about I guess the level of significance of pain that I was having, but I just didn't. I just thought it would be. It'll be okay. You know, it'll be okay. And, uh, and just so you guys know, when you don't run back on defense, I still get headaches. So we gotta get that. <laughs> oh man, I can't. Stan's twice as smart as me. He can work for me. <laughs> Stan's in Greece actually, and uh, so I texted with him this morning, and um, I mean he's. You know, he was obviously, I mean, you know, he's a mentor, he's one of my closest friends, and I'm not going to share the text, but, I mean, Stan's, you know, we're very close, so, yeah, but I, he can't work for me now. He can't do it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, uh, we just tried to do things the right way, and um, we try to respect the privacy and discretion of the people that we interviewed, and um, obviously wanted to keep our own um, you know, deliberations private because they change sometimes and certain guys may have different uh, aims and goals. So uh, it's something that we strive to do, not just with our coaching search, but with all of our business. You know, it's just, this is, this is a business where a lot, there are a lot of people that know what other guys are doing and then there are different levels of accuracy to those, <laughs> um, uh, you know, rumors and in innuendos. But by and large, teams that can kind of keep their business their own um, probably can win on the margins of not having to deal with external influences. And so, you know, it is something that we set out to do across the board. And obviously, it only works if, if the other people feel that way as well. So, you know, um, Coach Clifford and a lot of the people that we met with, you know, were discreet and they wanted it that way and we wanted it that way. And, that's just the way it worked out. Um, you know, Mike, I would actually harken back to your first question to answer this one. Um, for sure, a coach that can come in and impact a team will raise eyebrows. But what really attracted us is the long haul, you know, and that's, that's just that Steve was able to establish himself as an upper echelon coach. Um, you know, I can, I, can, I can throw numbers at you that, you know, his teams all five years led the league in defensive rebounding. They committed the fewest turnovers. The bottom line is when you play a Steve Clefford team, you have to beat them. They don't beat themselves. And over the course of five years, that's what the real attraction was. 
Well, I don't think you ever put a limit on a team. Uh, again, I, I think I know some of these guys well. I'm no expert right now in our roster. You know, that's for these next few weeks, and that takes study. Um, and then coming up with a you know a team game that uh, will bring out the strengths of the of the best players um, and establish a way we can be good on both offense and defense. So. Those are the decisions that will be made in these next uh, upcoming weeks. But I know this is you don't put limits on a team to me. I mean, there's no, listen, hopefully we'll come out and we'll play great early. Um, but uh, this is, you know, as Jeff always said, we need to build the right foundation. You have to start from scratch every year. That's what this league is about. Again, if you watch these, these games right now, it, still gets, it all gets down to the little things. It's a blown coverage, it's the wrong stance. It's a guy that talks late. It's somebody that doesn't sprint back and they're a step away from where they're supposed to be. And it's the difference between a good half and a bad half, you know? Um, so uh, a lot of it is how quickly uh, things come together. But as much of it, my, my mindset right now is everybody's got to get in the best shape they can this summer be working on the right things so their games are improving um, and come when we start in September in an incredible place mentally. And then you go from there. The summer is to get ready for training camp. That's what it is. And we need to have a great summer.